Thank you all so much for joining us. Um, my name is Oluwa Palmi Amanda Adiola. I'm a partner and solicitor advocate at BHP Law in Darlington, which is a regional law firm. Um, with me is Vanessa Sampaio of um, FLIP, uh, which is, and she's based at which office, sorry, Vanessa? So we're in London. In London. And today we're delighted to be uh, joined by Barbara Mills KC to talk all things arbitration. If you don't know, um, Barbara Mills Casey is a barrister, a mediator, an arbitrator, um, and also a recorder. She was called to the bar in 1990 and took silk in 2020. Um, she's also a bencher for Inner Temple and is a co-chair for the Bar Council's uh, Race Working uh, Group. She's also the co-editor of the uh, International Family Law Journal and a member of uh, Inner Temple's EDI uh, subcommittee. Thank you so much, Barbara, for giving us your time today. Um, we thought it was very important that we have you on to talk about arbitration and your role. Um, so um, we're really grateful that you have given us your time because we know how busy you are. For sure, it's always a pleasure. Thank you. We thought we'll just dive right in um, just to enlighten our um, audience, our members. The main reason why we wanted to do this really is to ensure that our members understand the various uh, means in which you can keep matters out of court because that's incredibly important. Um, this is something that is being championed not only by resolution, but also by the president of the family division and trying to make sure that the court system is not crippling under the enormous amount of work that it's got uh, coming through. Um, so if you could just tell us a little bit about arbitration, just so that we can understand what it is and why we should really be considering it as practitioners. For sure. Um, let me start with why you should consider it and kind of put it in a, in a context of kind of stats, facts and figures, because I think as lawyers, we, we start there and it, you kind of persuade people with that sort of information. Um, so in December, 2020, Resolution commissioned a YouGov um, survey uh, and it surveyed um, over a thousand divorcees who had just recently or in the last five years been through a divorce process. And what it found about their mental health was startling because 41% um, said that they'd had episodes of depression and anxiety, which was linked, they said, to the divorce proceedings. And about 54% of the people uh, who uh, participated in the survey said they'd had suicidal thoughts, again, that they would link to um, the, uh, the, the divorce they'd gone through. Uh, and what was what the other bit about that survey was that it showed that 21%, only 21% had understood what arbitration was through the process and about 36% understood mediation. What the survey doesn't tell you, or at least I haven't, it hasn't come to my attention, is how many actually use the process. So, so we know that it has a huge impact and we often talk about proceedings being stressful, but, but those numbers to me are really startling. And that was 2020 and we're still in 2022, no, re no further forward because um, I don't know whether you know, but Erwin Mitchell also had a survey recently, divorce, let's do it differently. Um, one in four didn't know about ADR. So this is again, a thousand people who were going through divorce. One in four didn't know anything about ADR. They were getting divorced and going to court, apparently. Over a third uh, were not offered ADR as an alternative. And over a quarter said they regretted not using ADR. Therefore, the appetite is there. But what comes through time and time again is that there isn't enough known of the process. And people are still uh, believe that they're getting divorced, they've got to go to court. So that's something that I'm really keen to change it because I think as family lawyers, part of why a lot of us do things is to help people get to more solid ground. So what is arbitration? Arbitration is a way to avoid court. Um, it provides you a binding decision. There is a, a, a decision in 2020 says that you can appeal. It used to be that we'd say to people it's final and binding. But actually for me, I think that that, that decision, Haley, is good because it means that you are no worse off for using arbitration. Because I think before people would say, well, if I use arbitration and I, not, I don't like the decision, what do I do? You can appeal. It's hard to, but you can. Um, so what do you do with arbitration? You appoint an arbitrator who will decide your issues. 
I'm only qualified to do children's stuff, so I will talk about the children's side of things. Um, sort of broadly speaking, the process is in five stages. So first of all, you start with the arbitration form, um, the ARB1CS, so ARB1CS with the children's scheme. Within that uh, application process, it asks you to confirm that there are no safeguarding issues. So parties declare that there are no safeguarding issues. And then there is also um, an onus on them to provide some information as to safeguarding. So um, either Disclosure Scotland or some people make an application so CAFCAS can actually prepare the safeguarding letter so that everybody knows what the situation is. As part of that process, if there have been CAFCAS reports or local authority reports, then, then the arbitration ought to see that. If they have lawyers, often the lawyers will agree the arbitrator, but if you don't, can't agree or don't have lawyers and, and, or, or the lawyers don't want to agree, you apply to IFLA, the Institute of Family Law Arbitrators, and they'll appoint an arbitrator for you. Um, the arbitrator then will arrange a case management hearing, often by telephone or Zoom, if that's what you prefer, have a look at what the issues are about, um, and then timetable it to either a review hearing or a final hearing, whatever it is the parties require. The process can also, depending on the issue, be done on paper. So depending on what, what it is you want the arbitrator to decide, it can be done on paper. Um, so those are kind of the, um, the, the steps. You then have an arbitration hearing, which is run as though it's a court hearing in the sense that if evidence is required, you can give evidence. Um, if the process requires the wishes and feelings to be understood about the child, you can have appointed an independent social worker. And then the arbitrator will give you a decision. Um, it's called a determination. So they give you the arbitral award. So it's that straightforward. It, it really is that straightforward to, to um, go through uh, the arbitration process and for me the benefits are huge but I'm sure we'll get to that. So it sounds an extremely flexible process um, and I suppose in a time where the courts are quite pressed and understanding the nature of the issues between the parties can be quite difficult in terms of the court grappling with the nuances of the cases. I mean how can parties address that with arbitration? Perfectly. I mean, arbitration is, is made for that. So as I said before, it requires the, uh, the parties to declare that there are no safeguarding issues. If you have safeguarding issues, then the process isn't for you. Um, the IFLA rules, but the Institute of Family Law Arbitrators rules provide very clearly the sorts of um, cases that can be arbitrated and the sorts that can't. So what I would say to people is refer to the IFLA rules. But in shorthand, the issues that can be dealt with in arbitration are any application that you make under section eight of the Children Act, so where children should live, who they should spend time with, holidays, school that they can attend. So all of those applications can be dealt with in arbitration. Um, and as I said, and you can deal with re relocations as well, both foreign, um, leave to remove, to relocate abroad, as long as it's a, a, a country that's signed up to the, the Hague Conventions, the, the 1980 and 1996. If it's one of those countries as the destination, you can use arbitration. And you can also use arbitration to deal with internal relocation. So there is a real breadth of the issues that are covered by arbitration. And why you would use it are the very obvious benefits. It's time efficient because you appoint your arbitrator and so you wouldn't appoint someone who was too busy to deal with your case within the time scales that you wanted. And depending on the issue and depending on the sort of evidence required, it can be done with really quickly. So efficiency. So going back to where I started that people's mental health are really affected by it. We know that delay is inimicable to everybody's welfare. And so the quicker people get through, the better. The other real benefit is that you choose your arbitrator or IFLA choose the arbitrator for you. And that's important because you're getting someone who is a specialist. So if it's children, for example, they're a specialist, really experienced uh, person who has done a lot of children law. Um, so for, by way of example, in my chambers for PB, we have 11 arbitrators and seven sit as judges. Was it six? Seven still out of the 11 
And out of the 11, six sit as silks. And out of that six, we have deputy high court judges, recorders and deputy district judges. So you are getting high quality, experienced practitioners who are also judges. And bearing in mind what parties often don't understand is that if you don't have safeguarding issues and you make an application to the court, you are going to be dealt with at the lowest rung of the family court system. I don't mean any disrespect to magistrates, but you are going to be at that level. And you and I both know that in certain courts, you're actually not even going to get magistrates, you'll often get the legal advisor. So that is what you are comparing it to. A, a silk who also sits as a deputy high court judge or a recorder versus, again, no disrespect to legal advisors, but, but a legal advisor. There is flexibility because you choose your arbitrator, you choose your dates, uh, the arbitrator is accessible. So once you've chosen that person, if there are any issues that can't be agreed, they're an email away. Um, it's collaborative in a sense that the parties join to choose or join to approach IFLA for the arbitrator. The costs are something that people often talk about and I can see why. And there are four, yeah, there are four areas of cost, if you like, in arbitration. There is the arbitrator's fee. There is sometimes the fee for the venue, not if you came to 4PB because we have facilities, but other people don't. There is then the cost if you have an expert like an ISW, you have their costs, and then you have legal costs for paying your lawyers. Um, and people often say, oh gosh, that's very expensive. All of that is fixed. You wouldn't enter into arbitration without knowing what the arbitrator is going to charge you. And that is to hear the case, prepare the determination and send it to you. So you have an idea of it. And often people forget that there is a real cost if you're not getting a decision made because sometimes you and I know that the process creates satellite disputes. If you're waiting to decide how the children will spend time with somebody, every handover could be an issue, you know, so letters are being written, stress is going up. So there are hidden costs of litigation uh, it, through the court process as well that people often conveniently forget about. Um, the Resolution in arbitration is also incredibly discreet. So if you had uh, clients who don't particularly want the world to know that they're arguing with their children, for example, arbitration is perfect. You would have excellent facilities when you choose arbitration. There's no question of talking in the corridor. You would have rooms that you can sit and talk privately. It's at your page, you can have breakouts. So the entire process is really efficient. It's very client focused and um, and it, it, it can be bespoke because you can tailor it to whatever it is the parties want. You can tell I'm a fan. It, it sounds like an incredible process that more of us really ought to be considering from our, from our clients' perspective. But if we go back on, on the costs, because yes. that's one of the things that people flag up about, you know, sometimes saying it's more expensive than actually going to court. But then you've sort of circumvented that by saying in terms of time scales, you're probably waiting longer to have a hearing and you have all the issues with timetabling, etc. I think it's no um, <laughs> it's no secret that the court is trying to grapple with all the backlog from COVID and they haven't quite caught up. What would you suggest to family lawyers then in terms of being able to encourage their clients to look at this as an option? The key sort of points that they really ought to be saying to their clients about why they should be considering arbitration rather than going through the court process? The common reason, so I, I'm told a number of reasons why people often don't, or, or lawyers don't want to suggest it. Some lawyers, and, and remember, I'm going to say solicitors because most people are coming to you guys first, um, but most um, solicitors, feel, I'm told, that if they have a hand in choosing the arbitration, arbitrator, they feel like their clients might level an, an element of blame that they wouldn't if you got to court and it was just, you know, somebody that you didn't know. I think you should, I think that requires you to say, look, as I've said, if you're getting high quality and you prepare your case well, then you are putting your case into the hands of someone who experienced and, and will deal with the case properly and fairly. I think we persuade by explaining to clients that what they pay to an arbitrator might seem a lot of money, but the cost, as I said, not particularly hidden of waiting for the decision. In my experience, clients who don't 
want the decision made. They don't, they know what's coming. You've given them the advice. You've said, you know, the way the law is going to be applied means that I'm really sorry, but your children are going to start spending more time with the other parent or whatever. That's the person who is going to maybe be reluctant and there is something to be gained by waiting. My view is that you, again, you explain to people the cost of waiting, the cost of not having the, the resolution. But in the end, you can't, of course, make people do it. But I think that there's a piece of work that the court might, should start doing, which is there should be cost consequences if people, where there are no safeguarding issues and somebody just kind of belligerently says, I'm not going to arbitrate, then the court should, when they've made an application and they're in court, ask the question. You know, and I know that you can't compare the resolution of a, a children dispute with a commercial one, but in commercial, in the commercial world, arbitration is the first port of call. It's written into contracts. That's what you do, you know. Um, and I think it, it's a mindset change that we need to really help clients. It's not easy. I'm not pretending it's easy. But if we, if if there is a good buy-in into arbitration and we buy into the efficiency and the fact that the issues are resolved quicker, fairer, then I suspect we might get greater take up. And also remember, I mean, the other thing is that it's not all or nothing. So even if you're waiting to go to court, there are other things that you can do in arbitration. You can decide, you know, I've done cases where the parties had permission to instruct an independent social worker, but they couldn't agree the identity. So they're back and forth for a long time. They sent the application to the judge and, and it just seemed to sit on the court file and it, time was ticking on. And so it came to arbitration. They wanted me to decide it on paper and I decided it on paper by looking at CVs and giving them the decision. Holidays, schools, all sorts of issues can be dealt with even if you are in a court process. You can have issues that you take to arbitration. Thank you. That's that's really useful. And I think it's also helpful for us as solicitors to understand what types of cases would not be suitable for arbitration. And I know you mentioned and touched on uh, cases where there are safeguarding issues in particular. Um, and in such cases, would there be anything you can say to sort of circumvent that being an issue and to overcome that? Well, it's interesting, actually, because I think sometimes if people are persuaded that arbitration is the right way to go, what they might want to put before a court as a safeguarding issue becomes something that they'll say, well, it's just context. I'm just telling you that I'm concerned about, you know, the mother's ability to supervise the children as opposed to a safeguarding concern. But if there are genuine, clear safeguarding concerns, then arbitration is not the right for it because the rules are clear and, and it has to be very boundaried. Um, if, the, uh, if it's a child abduction, it's, it's not possible to use arbitration. It, there, there are very clearly stated exceptions to the rule. And if, that, if any of those exceptions apply, then however much you want to use it, you won't be able to because you'll get as far as the arbitration would get pushed back because he or she won't take on a case with, which is exempted. 